How's everybody doing today? So um, I updated a few things on the page yesterday. Uh, you probably, you may have noticed. If you didn't, you should. So I um, have the book on here. I think I mentioned that yesterday. I did get the links made properly for the videos. Audios are now posted, and the final exam is on Monday of finals week at 2 p.m. So joy of joy. We have that to look forward to. Okay, so today I'm going to... Uh, finish talking about buffers um, and say a little bit about them. I'm going through this kind of methodically because I want you to make sure that you have an understanding about how this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation works and what it tells us because we're going to use that. It's not going to disappear. We're going to use that uh, when we talk more about how uh, uh, charges within a protein can change as a result of pH and how pH change can therefore change the structure of a protein. So that's going to be the reason I'm bringing, that's one of the main reasons I'm bringing this up right now is so that you understand that. As we're going to see, and you're going to hear a lot, all right, the structure of a protein is absolutely critical. It's the most important thing in all of the molecular nature of biology, all right? The structure of the protein. So we're going to see that the structure of a protein is a very tenuous sort of thing. You're going to see a little bit of it with charge, and you'll see some other considerations for it as well. So we will spend a lot of time on that. So the reason I'm wanting you to understand how the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is telling us how protons come off of molecules is important, because when a proton comes off of a molecule, the charge on that molecule changes. Okay? A proton has a positive charge. So I take a positive charge away from something, it becomes more negative. It's a very, very important thing. All right, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, I, it's not going to take a lot to finish today, and that's good because I have to get out of here early. So we're probably going to finish early today. And um, that doesn't sadden anybody, I'm guessing. <laughs> but I promise I'll have a jam-packed lecture for you on Friday. How's that? Well, that may sadden everybody then, yeah, so. Okay. Um, all right, so I put it into words here. Big, bold words, big, bold equation. As I said, you don't need to memorize the equation, okay? But the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is one of the most important equations that we will work with, all right? The pH is equal to the pKa plus the log, the salt over the acid, all right? Now, if you remember my equation from last time with respect to salts and acids, I will remind you that a weak acid looks like this. And the difference between an acid and a salt is exactly one proton. Exactly one proton between an acid and a salt. A proton, remember I said, is not the acid. The acid is the thing that has the proton. All right. There's a difference. Notice what's happened on this molecule. This molecule has gone from a charge of 0 to a charge of minus 1. That's consistent with what I just told you, right? It lost a positive one charge, therefore it becomes more negative, so it's gone from zero to minus one. We're going to see another important ionization that happens or a change in charge that happens in amino acids in which amine groups, which are positively charged, lose a proton, and they go from a charge of plus one to a charge of zero. Okay, so we see changes that can happen in a couple of ways uh, with respect to uh, differences in the number of protons that these various things contain. Okay, So the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. How many of you went back and looked at problems last night? Good. A lot of people didn't. Okay. You're students like me. You know. Don't be students like me. Be students like these ones that went back and looked at the problems. All right. Um, I, I think that what you will find if you sit and you look at these and you work through these problems is that they're not that difficult conceptually. But they're going to seem very complicated at first if you haven't messed with them. You probably didn't get this in freshman chemistry to the extent that you needed to, and it's important that you understand these. All right? So when I think of the ratio of salt to acid, okay, that ratio is important because it tells me, in this case, how much A minus I have and how much HA I have. Right? That might be important if I think about oh, I don't know, let's say a million different protein molecules that I have. 
and they've got a group on them that has a proton on them at a certain pH, and a certain percentage of those protein molecules have that same proton off. Let's say it's 50-50. Okay? If that proton is on, the protein may have a certain shape, and that proton's off, that protein may have a different shape. One of those shapes doesn't work, and one of those shapes does work. It doesn't matter for our purposes right now which one it is. If I have that situation, then I know 50% of all the proteins I have in that solution don't work. Because 50% of them have that proton off. Let's say I have a 10 to 1 ratio of salt to acid. I know that I've got 10 times as many of those proteins that have one shape as have the other shape. If having the proton off makes the protein work, I've got 10 times as many that work that don't. If having that proton off means that the protein doesn't work, then I've only got a small percentage of those proteins that function. You see? So knowing the relative amounts of this proton off or proton on within a, an amino acid of a protein is a very, very useful thing for us to understand. Because the number of molecules of an enzyme that are active in a cell is a factor in understanding how many reactions can occur in a cell. It's a very important factor. We're going to see, in fact, later in the term when we talk about control of enzymes, that one of the ways in which cells control enzymes is by controlling how many active enzymes they have. It's a very simple concept. Well, one of the ways in which that control is important to consider is by the ratio of this right here. This really, this equation is really important for us. So that we're going to treat it in very simple ways, salts and acids. They have very important implications, and we extend that into bigger molecules that can have these groups that ionize. Does that make sense? Nobody yeah. said anything. Yes, OK. Yes, yes, teacher. OK. OK. Now, memorize this table for the first exam, and you'll be all set. Oh, you get me very quickly. I usually have to do that a couple times before people realize I'm joking. So, no, you're not going to go memorize this list. But this shows a list of several important weak acids in biochemistry. All right? And as you look at this, you're going to see something that um, we haven't talked about yet. Some of these weak acids have more than one group that can ionize. They have more than one group that can ionize. Well, let's start with a simple one, pyruvic acid. We also call this pyruvate. And people always say, what's the difference between pyruvate and pyruvic acid? All right? Technically, pyruvic acid means it has the proton on, and pyruvate's what people say when it's off. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to call them the same thing, pyruvic acid and pyruvate. All right? You hear one, you've got the other. That's true for any ic acid. When you see any ic acid, we can put an 8 on the end of it, and it'll be the same thing. Succinic acid, succinate. Bang. Same thing. Glutamic acid, glutamate, bang, same thing. Make sense? You had enough ic acids, all right? We get to eat some ic acids. That kind of sounds like there's a nutrition thing for you, right? We ate some ic acids. All right, maybe not. Pyruvic acid, pyruvate, all right? With the proton on, it looks like this. With the proton off, it looks like that. The only difference between those two guys right there is that one proton, all right? There's only one proton on that molecule that can come off. You'll notice there's several hydrogens on there, but only one of them can come off. The one that's on the carboxyl is this one right here. This guy has a pKa of 2.5. What would you say about that weak acid? Characterize it for me. It's a relatively strong weak acid, right? In fact, it's the strongest, well, it's almost the strongest weak acid that's on it. There's one at 1.23, right? It's one of the strongest weak acids that's on this table. It's definitely stronger than formic acid, 3.75. If I were to say, for example, that how would I prove that formic acid is a weaker acid than pyruvic acid, how would I do that? Well, the answer would be the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation would tell me. 
How would I know how to do that? Well, let's think about that. Let's say, all right, I've got these two acids. One has a pKa of, of 2.5 and one has a pKa of 3.75. Let's go. And we see the difference here. Here's formic acid, proton off, proton on, right? Let's go back to our henderson hasselbalch henderson hasselbalch equation. All right. Let's imagine I've got a solution of pyruvic acid over here, and I've got a solution of formic acid over here. OK? Two solutions, one over here, one over here. Let's say they're both the same pH. And for convenience, let's say that that pH is 2.5, which happens to be the pKa of pyruvic acid. I could just as easily pick 3.76, which is the of 3.75, which is the uh, pKa of formic acid. All right? But let's say I've got two solutions. They're both at pH 2.5. Let's think about the relative amounts of salt and acid I have in each of those for each different species. So let us start with formic acid. Formic acid, I have a pH of 2.5. I have a pKa of 3.75, right? I take 3.75 to this side, I get a negative number, right? Everybody with me? Negative number is equal to the logarithm. Which do I have more of? OK. Got more acid. OK. Got more acid. If I have formic acid, and I've got it at pH 2.5, and I've got the pKa is 2.5, what does that tell me about the relative amounts of salt and acid that I have? They're equal. OK? Which one has ionized more at two point, pH 2.5? The one that has half of it is acid, right? Because it's gone, it's gone halfway there. The first one had more, more salt, I'm sorry, more acid than salt. It hadn't ionized as much. The second one has ionized more because it has equal amounts of salt and acid, right? Isn't the definition of the strength of an acid how much it ionizes? So at the same pH, these two acids, one has ionized more than the other one has, right? Formic acid has ionized more. henderson hasselbalch told us what it means when we said that formic acid was a stronger acid than was acetic acid. Uh, than was, um, I'm sorry, pyruvic acid was a stronger acid than was formic acid, right? Make sense? OK. So that's the kind of things where the, the henderson hasselbalch equation will bail you out. It'll tell you information that you need to know, and you need to learn how to apply that equation. Okay. Now, I told you earlier that pH is important because pH really, really does af uh, affect a protein. And the reason it affects a protein is because it changes the charges within a protein because of the ionization that I've described to you. We see two different, two very different proteins here. Let me explain these graphs to you, all right? On the y-axis, we're plotting activity. By the way, in this class, the rule is any time you draw a graph, it absolutely has to have its axes labeled properly. Because without proper labels, a graph has no meaning. It becomes art. And art doesn't tell us anything quantitative. It tells us something very beautiful, but it doesn't tell us any information. All right? So whenever you draw a graph, if you don't have labels, that you don't have the, gra the, the axes properly labeled, you didn't draw a graph, you drew art. Okay? And this is not an art class. I like art as much as the next person, but I'm not here to grade your art. Okay? All right. So activity, how active the enzyme is, how much of it is is doing its thing, right? This might be 100% up here, OK? This might be 100% up here. On the x-axis, we plot pH. And we see that as the pH changes, we see the activity changes. It goes up for pepsin and then way down over here. We see the maximum for pepsin activity is up around pH 3. We look at trypsin. These are both enzymes, by the way, that break down proteins. They both break down proteins. They're involved in digestion. Your digestive system makes these enzymes. This guy has a maximum activity around 6. 
Now, it teaches us, first of all, something very important. And that very important thing is that proteins have their own characteristics. That's number one. And number two, it tells us that proteins have evolved to do specific things. What are the specific things that they're doing? Well, pepsin is found in the stomach. Your stomach is full of acid. It's a very acidic environment. The pH is in the range of 1 to 2. If pepsin can't be active in that environment, we're not going to be able to digest a lot of protein. This enzyme has evolved an ability to be active at pH 3, roughly. Okay? Very, very useful. Whereas trypsin isn't found in the stomach. It's found lower in the digestive tract where the, where the, enzyme, where, where the acid concentration has reduced considerably. And the place where it's at is about the pH of the intestine where it's located. Now, what happens if I take trypsin and I put it in the stomach? Well, we can see pretty quickly what's going to happen. At pH 3, it's going to have maybe 10 or 15% of the activity it would have at pH 6. It's not going to be nearly as active. And the reason it's not going to be active is because at pH 3, it's going to have a different charge on it than it's going to have at pH 6. Similarly, if I take pepsin and I take it out of the stomach and I put it in the digestive system where the pH is roughly about 6, we see, look at this, well, maybe 10 or 15%. Again, it's way lower than it is in the environment in which it's normally located. Now, charge, as charge of a protein changes, the shape of the protein will change, and so too will the activity of the protein change. We're going to see dozens of examples of this during the term. OK. Well, we're getting to the point where we can start talking about titration curves. We can finally start talking about those things that you did in freshman chemistry. This shows a representation of a titration curve for acetic acid. And I want to think about the relevant components of this, this titration curve. First of all, the y-axis is pH. The x-axis is equivalence of hydroxyl that's been added. Okay. When we look at this graph, we see, oh. Ouch. Hopefully nothing valuable. Pencil sharpener. OK, that won't hurt anything. All right. So when we look at this, we see, we see a curve that we're going we're gonna to see a lot of. It starts, and if we were to draw it all the way down here, it would, start, it would start way down here. It would go up rapidly. It would lay out, and then it would go up rapidly again over here. That's how it would look. And since I'm doing this for folks in TV land, it would start here, and it would go up here. And we'll go up over here. I always have to think about TV land. It's important because a lot of people watch these on video, and it's important that they see what I'm showing you. So this is the, the thing that's, that's got um, this. All right. Anyway, what does this graph mean? What does this graph mean? Okay. Well, what this graph means is the pH is changing. It means when I'm way down here at pH 1, what's the concentration of protons? Is it high or is it low? That was the other guess. It's high, right? Low pH means high proton concentration, right? Very high proton concentration. So the protons are concentrated way down here. If I have plenty of protons and I have something that can hold protons, and the something that can hold protons is what in our equation? The salt. The salt has the ability to grab a proton, so it can hold a proton, right? So if I have excess protons, what's the salt going to do? It's going to gobble up protons, right? So if I think about pH 1 way down over here, okay, most of my molecules or most of my salt or acid are going to be present in salt or acid form. It's going to be in the acid form because the protons have been gobbled up by the salt. When, I, when, the, pro, when the salt gobbles protons, it becomes an acid, right? The A minus becomes an HA. You put a proton on A minus, you get HA. So down here, where I've got excess protons, I'm essentially 100% HA. Well, that's what HA looks like right there for acetic acid. I have essentially 100%. And as the pH goes up, as I start adding hydroxyl, and by the way, this is a strong base. It's the only time we use that term. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. I add sodium hydroxide. What does sodium hydroxide do when I put it into a solution with protons. 
It gobbles up the protons and it makes water. OH minus plus H plus equals water. Right? So what's happening is when I start adding OH is the proton concentration starts falling. Proton concentration starts falling. What's going to happen to this guy? It's going to start losing protons, right? Because there's no longer protons jumping onto it, staying on there and holding onto it. In fact, the protons are going to start coming off. You know that from Henderson Hasselbach. How do you know that? Well, let's imagine that we get to a pH of 4.76, which is the pKa of acetic acid. You know from what we did before that at 4.76, we're going to have an equal amount of salt and acid. So if we go from essentially no salt to equal amounts, we've got to have a transition in between there, right? That's what this curve is showing us. We have a transition. Now, there's something else that's very important this curve is showing us. At first, the pH changes fairly rapidly. It goes up fairly rapidly. In fact, your book didn't even draw it because it goes up that rapidly. All right? When the pH changes very quickly for a proton or a hydroxyl that we add, okay, it's like we have water. If I take water and I add a tiny amount of protons to it, I'll see the pH will drop precipitously. If I add a tiny amount of OH to it, I'll see the pH will rise precipitously. And it will rise very much like this guy rises if I add OH. And if I add protons, it will fall very much like this does. Water is not a buffer. A buffer is something that resists change in pH. There's a definition. If you want to memorize a definition, I would strongly encourage that. Okay? A buffer is something that resists change in pH. Yes, sir? You're getting ahead of me, but uh, yes. Okay? A buffer is something that resists a change in pH. And there is a limit to that, to be sure, and that's where, where he's coming from. There's a limit to that. And we'll talk about that, but yes. All right? So, well, acetic acid, all weak acids, every weak acid on the face of the earth, 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 can't say it, earth, can act like a buffer. Every weak acid on the face of the earth can act like a buffer. There are zero exceptions. Well, acetic acid is a weak acid, so you may extrapolate from that that, well, Kevin said it, so it must be that acetic acid can act like a buffer. Gesundheit. And in fact, that's correct. This graph shows us that it can act like a buffer. How does it do that? Well, let's look at this. From here to here, I added a very tiny amount of OH. From here to here. What happened to the pH? pH went from here up to here. It jumped probably almost four units. Right? That's an amount on this graph. Right? That's an amount. What happens if I go from here to here? How much does the pH rise? Very little. We're starting to see a buffer. Because this system right here is resisting the rise in the pH. We've gotten to a point on this graph where, OK, we're not going to rise so much. Notice it's still rising slowly, but it's not rising anything like the rate that it was rising right here. OK? This system is starting to act like a buffer. It's starting to resist the change in pH. Okay. If I had water, what would happen? Going, it would just go up like that. No, fault, no laying out in the curve like that. It just goes up. Okay. The buffer is doing something very special here. All right. Well, as it's going up, something's happening to the ratio of salt to acid. Right. The ratio of salt to acid is increasing or decreasing as we're going up. I know I'll guess wrong. And he, what? It's increasing. We start with very little salt. We're getting to 50-50 here. 
we must be increasing the amount of salt. Therefore, the ratio of salt to acid is increasing. At this point, we're at 50-50. And look at that. When the pH equals the pKa, the concentration of the salt equals the concentration of the acid. We can use that as a definition for pKa. The pKa is the pH at which the concentration of salt equals the concentration of the acid. There's another definition. It wouldn't be bad to know. Okay? The pKa is just a pH. It's a special pH. It's the pH at which the concentration of the salt equals the concentration of the acid. Well, it's starting to get good, okay? We're rising, and the pH is still going up, and we keep adding more and more protons, and we see we're still fairly flat, but then all of a sudden we get over here, and look what happens. pH starts to rise. Why? Why does the pH go wacko as I go far off to the right? It's past the one unit. Um. Well, that's not the reason, no. That's, but you're partly right, but that's not the reason. All the acid you took. We've used up all the acid. It's the ratio of these two that are holding the pH constant. When I have too much of one versus the other, I no longer have a buffer. All right? Now, what he said was partly right. Okay? We are one pH unit away. And it turns out that if we're more than a pH unit away, we essentially don't have a very good buffer. So if I look at acetic acid and I say, what's the buffering region for acetic acid? The buffering region for acetic acid is between 3.76 and 5.76, one unit below to one unit above. If I'm more than one unit below, I don't have very much salt. If I'm more than one unit above, I don't have very much acid. And it's the combination of these two that resist that change in pH. Now I'll ask you, where do you think that the buffer has the maximum capacity, the maximum ability to resist change in pH? Where? Don't say equilibrium. Okay? No. Equilibrium okay, does not mean what you think it does. That's another freshman chemistry problem. Okay? Equilibrium does not, underline not, mean equal concentrations. Okay? Equilibrium is when we have equal amounts of salt and acid. And that's at 4.76. Okay? I'm not getting on you about equilibrium. I'm getting, I, I hate freshman chemistry. They can't teach students these very simple things. And you're not alone. Most people come out thinking equilibrium means equal concentrations. It's not true and it's ridiculous. Okay? I'll hammer that in your head this term. All right. So maximum buffering capacity occurs when the pH equals the pKa for a given system. Now, you've learned an awful lot of stuff about buffers there. Awful lot of stuff about buffers. What happens if you have more than one proton that can come off? Well, this doesn't show it, unfortunately. But I'll ask you to think about a curve. Okay? You saw this curve for acetic acid. It's got one proton that can come off. What if I had a molecule that had two protons that could come off? One that had a pKa of 3.5 and one that had a pKa of 7.5. Every horizontal thing is going to correspond to a buffering region. And I've got two weak acids in the same molecule. So I can imagine it's going to go up, it's going to flatten at 3.5, it's going to go up and it's going to flatten at 7.5 and it's going to go up again. That's exactly what happens. Very good. Make sense? Being able to envision this in your head is a very powerful tool. Very, very powerful tool. Okay. Now, this happens to be an acid that has multiple protons, but they're only looking at one region, the region where this one proton comes off. But if we looked at this one, it actually has three different protons that could come off. And you could say, piece of cake. 
Up, flat, up, flat, up, flat, up, right? A flat for every time I have a pKa. Because every time I have a flat, it means it's resisting a change in pH. That takes a pKa value. And a pKa value corresponds to a weak acid. And I told you that every single weak acid can be a buffer. Flat regions buffer, bang, you've got it. Now we're going to see amino acids, which we'll talk about starting on Friday. Amino acids have more than one proton that can come off. Some have two, some have three. But you can start to imagine how those curves are going to look, because every time we have a pKa, we're going to have a flattening of the curve. All right. It's time to review. Please join me. Henderson, Hasselbach, you put my brain in shock. Oh, woe is me. The PKAs can make me lie in bed awake. They give me really bad headaches. Oh, hear me, my plea. Salt acid ratios help keep the pH froze by buffering. I can't hear you. They show tenacity, complete audacity, if used with incapacity to maintain things. I know when ages fly, a buffer will defy them actively. Those protons cannot waltz when they get bound to salts. With this, the change in pH halts all praise to thee. Thus, now that I've addressed the topic for the test, I've got no how. The pH, I can say, equals the pKa. In sum with log of S or A, I know it now. OK. Please don't encourage me. So that's enough for today, guys. <laughs>